You may be seated. Let me just for a few moments share with you. I, you probably get tired of me talking about gospel mission, but it's okay because uh, I, I'm going to keep sharing about it. Um, but I was, I was thinking about... I learned about Gospel Mission probably in 2003 when they first started. And I want to tell you just a little bit about my experience with Gospel Mission. Gospel Mission, actually, it was weekend, it was Super Bowl weekend. We used to have a big canned food drive called Super Bowl, S O U P E R, Bowl Sunday. Um, and we had a big canned food drive at my church in Williamstown. Um, and one day, Candy, uh, the director of Gospel Mission, heard that we were doing a canned food drive. And this is, again, back before it first started. Uh, they didn't have much. And she reached out to me and said, would you have any extra food for our food pantry? And I was like, I had never heard of them before. And so um, I'm one of those people that I'm going to go check things out. I, you know, I want to investigate and so I went over and talked to Candy um, and um, began to hear about what their passion was for the ministry of Gospel Mission. And Gospel Mission's vision is all about feeding people, meeting people's fit. So that um, they can meet their spiritual need. You know, it's okay to meet people's physical need, but if they've got a spiritual need, that's even more important uh, than the physical need. And so Gospel Mission, they, they believe in sharing food with people. And the, thing, the other thing that I like about them is um, two things. Number one, it doesn't make any difference. They don't, you don't fill out any paperwork. You don't have to prove that you need it. They'll, they'll help anybody. That's number one. Number two is... Um, they take no government funds because they will not take anything that limits them from giving out Bibles and God's Word to people. And I'm like, that's a lot of faith. You know how easy it would be to, for them to take government funds or whatever and just feed people? But they refuse because there's no way they're going to stop their mission uh, of giving out God's Word to people um, and sharing the spiritual side. So when I learned about Candy's mission and Jeff, I'm like, sign us up because that's right what we need to be doing. Um, and so even, you know, in my time at Williamstown, then when I came here, uh, Pastor Relations even agreed just even last year that they will continue to be one of our ministry partners. We don't have a food pantry here in the church because we don't need a food pantry. They're already doing it. Uh, so we come alongside and support them. And so what we do once a year is we do this thing called Mountain of Food where we try to uh, help fill up the food pantry. We used to do it in December, but what we learned is everybody gives in December and, you know, November, December, and come winter time, they're struggling. So we said we're going to move our, you know, collection to later on in the year because, we want to make sure they are able to provide food every week, 52 weeks out of the year, not just a few weeks out of the year. And so that's why we picked March, uh, February, March time period for us to be able to collect for gospel mission. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever been hungry, uh, ever struggled, but if there was a time in my life where I was struggling to get food, Personally, there's only one place I would want to go, and that is gospel mission, because they don't look down on you. They love you. They open arms and hug you and love you. They don't judge you. That's the kind of place I would want to go. If I were in need of food, it, that's hard enough, you know, to say, admit that you have a need, but to be able to go somewhere to know that they're not going to judge you, they're going to love you. That's the kind of place I want to go, and that's the kind of place I want our church to support. Um, so part of your tithe goes to 
supporting gospel mission, they're in our budget. Um, and I believe it's $200 a month. We support them financially, but we also support them. I know the women's circle every month collects items for them. Um, but I, I want you to know, one of the things I've said even just recently again is full transparency. I want people to know why is it we support what we support. I want you all to know why we do what we do here at the church. Um, and so um, that's gospel mission, and I'll never get tired of talking about their mission because I believe in it that much. And we as a church and leadership and staff believe in it. So I want us to bow our heads as we transition to the sermon. I want you to think for just a few moments. What, um, how has God answered your prayers this week? I'm sure he has. Or maybe the last couple weeks. And I'd like for you just to take and reflect a few moments on an answer to prayer and just say, thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer. Or maybe there's a prayer he hasn't quite answered yet. Maybe today you say, Lord, I, I'm still waiting for that answer. I know you're going to answer me, but I'm still waiting. In the next few moments of quiet, just to reflect on whether it's an answer to prayer or something else that you're really praying for that he's not answered yet. Father, I know all of us have answers to prayer in our lives, and sometimes I think we fail to turn back and say thank you for that answer to prayer. And then I also know, Lord, there are other prayers that we're waiting for the answers to. Lord, that waiting sometimes is hard. But help us to remember you are for us and you are working things even when we can't see it. You're working it out. So I pray to, this morning for each of us, no matter what it is we're praying for, that we remember who it is that answers our prayers. The creator of the universe. Thank you, Father, for this day. And now as we get ready to turn to the message, I pray that you will speak through the words that Brittany and I will share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are um, beginning part two of our sermon series. It's called Speak My Language. Um, and Brittany and I are sort of doing this together. Um, so what I want to do is I want to remind us what what, what we started this series for, the reason we started this series is that it, it is the month, February is the month of love. Tomorrow is uh, a Valentine's Day, and that's really why we started this series. But the idea was not that it's just a feeling. It's one thing to be, to have feelings of love toward people, but it's another thing to demonstrate that. Um, and so that's our hope um, and, and that we demonstrate it in meaningful ways to the people we come into contact with. So, um, am I on? Okay, I'm gonna. <laughs> Technical difficulties. We're getting new microphones this week. Um, going to be installed, so hopefully that is going to take care of whatever issues we're facing. Okay, I have number 10 now. Um, so just like with any language, we're talking about the five love languages. Just like with any language, um, most people only speak one. And if you're not fluent in a language, you have to take the time to learn how to speak it so that other people, um, the people that you're trying to communicate with, you have to learn their language um, so they can receive what you're trying to communicate. Um, it's important because we don't all have the same love language. I was thinking this morning while we were driving in, if I went to France today, 
I would not expect the people of France to speak to me in English. It would be my responsibility to learn their language. And that's similar with the love languages. We each have different languages, so um, I'm not going to try to speak to you in a language that's not your own. So I'm going to remind you what those love languages are. The first is words of affirmation, which is what we're going to talk about today. Then you have quality time, receiving gifts, physical touch, and acts of service. We talked about something about a love tank last Sunday, and that's what these totes represent. We all have a love tank. Every person's love tank is different. Um, and different things fill up and make people feel loved. And so our goal, hopefully in this series, is that we begin to learn and get in tune with what people around us, what will fill their love tank, so we can speak their language. That is the, the ideal goal. And so, for instance, there, we left these up on the table of just sort of examples that we can use um, to help people to feel loved. Uh, like words of affirmation is what we're going to have today, um, and thank you cards. Or those of you who have sent me birthday cards this week, I appreciate the fact that you took time out of your day to send me a card or a text or an email or a message on Facebook. That all, that's all meaningful. If your love language is words of affirmation, those things are all important. Um, then we have quality time, which would be like a, a game just sitting down one-on-one -on -one and, and, you know, talking and communicating. Then we have gifts. That's what this, uh, these flowers represent. Some people love to get gifts and they feel loved and appreciated when they get gifts. This, these two seals represent um, physical touch. Some people feel loved uh, when, they're, uh, when there's physical touch. And then this pan and uh, cloth are for um, acts of service. So we're talking about, um, Pastor Chad mentioned earlier, we're talking about the love languages, but we're not just talking about romantic love. What we're talking about today and for the rest of this series is something called agape love. We talked about that last week, so if you missed that, go back and watch last week's message. Um, it's available online on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, but it's not a feeling, it's an action, something that we're doing um, to represent God's love. Um, he showed you last week this book, The Five Love Languages. What you might not know is there are several versions of this book. This one, um, this one is the romantic one. This is what we use in uh, premarital counseling. But there are versions for children, there are versions for teenagers, versions for military. So this is not just romantic love. This is more about how we communicate love or how we communicate God's love with other people. Yeah, and so last week we sent out um, a text message. It was also on our Facebook page about the test. Did anybody take the test, the love language test? It's okay to raise your hand, okay. Um, and um, my love language... Oh, the link expired. Okay, well... Thank you for letting us know that because we, we... We can send it out again. Yeah, we'll send it out message. again. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, but, you know, well, the, one of the languages is words of affirmation, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Anybody experienced that their love language was words of affirmation? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah, so again, so that's what we're really going to be talking about um, in this message today. Um, and one of the things that, as Brittany was talking last week about this love language, especially since it's mine, one of the things I want to make sure we understand is if words of affirmation is your love language, it's not about an ego boost. You know, there are certain people that always want to pat on the back to make themselves feel better or whatever. It's not about that at all. Um, it's about me feeling valued, that what you did mattered to someone else. Um, that's really what this love language is referring to. Again, it's not about, you know, I don't want you to tell me, you know, hey, Chad, that was a great job, and you didn't mean it. You know, great sermon, Pastor, and you walk out the door and you go, that was one of the worst sermons ever. You know, I don't, I don't, that's not what I'm looking for, but I often think, you know, the best compliment you can give me 
is to walk out of the doors and say, you taught me something new about God's word today. You know, or I'm, I'm growing closer to the Lord because of what you shared with me. That's meaningful. That's genuine. Yeah, I want to share a personal example. Um, this morning, Stephanie, Owen's mom over here, doesn't know it, but she spoke some words of affirmation to me this morning that um, she probably didn't know it was something that I prayed for. And so that made me feel more loved by God. Um, just her obedience to say something, um, something that other people have shared in this room at different times. But when we choose to speak those words of affirmation, it really does make us feel closer to God. It makes us feel loved by God and seen and understood by God. So um, that's a, an example of personal one-to-one -one affirmation. Um, we also mentioned things like a thank you card or um, an, an encouraging text message. Those were the examples we used last week. It can be something you speak, something that's written down, um, but it's from somebody directly to you or from you directly to somebody else. Um, so you might be wondering, now that you kind of know what words of affirmation means, you might be wondering, why are we starting here? So um, anybody here realize that your words have extreme power? They have power over your life. They have power um, over your relationships. They have power over your attitude. Our words have extreme power. Um, so we're starting with words of affirmation. It's where the book starts. It's where we start with premarital counseling. Um, but words are something that we use with everybody. We um, use them with our loved ones and our family and our home. We use them in the workplace. Um, my favorite, on social media. We use a lot of words on social media. Um, some of you are going to use some words tonight watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> Hopefully they're positive words. <laughs> but we use words everywhere we go. And um, everything we do starts with our words. So um, I was thinking as I was driving in again this morning, about um, the first sermon that I ever preached here was actually a sermon on words. I think it's the same passage we're going to use today. But um, I remembered this fact from five years ago when we did this sermon. And do you know how many words you speak in one day? Depending on your job, you speak between 7,000 and 20,000 words per day. The average person speaks about 16,000 words every single day. So that's a lot of chances to say something positive or to say something negative, up to 20,000 words per day. So even if words of affirmation is not your love language, our words are very important and um, they have extreme power. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we need to remember how powerful our words are. If you remember back when you were kids, or maybe you parents used to say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I think that's one of the, the uh, most uh, false statements out there. Because I'm going to tell you what, I don't ever remember, you know, getting hit with a stick or whatever by a friend, or hit with a rock or whatever. But I'm going to tell you what, I do remember what people say. And it echoes in my mind. You know, I can think back, just, this is a quick example. Um, in eighth or ninth grade, I could not do mechanical drawing. And I will never forget the teacher looking at me and say, Chad, you're never going to make anything of yourself. In eighth or ninth grade. I'll never forget that. Okay, those words cut. So you talk about words having power. So when I graduated college, I wanted to take my degree to that guy's house and knock on his door and say, see, when I got my master's degree, I wanted to go knock on his door and say, see, when I got my first pastoring job, I wanted to go say, see, these people believe that I can make something of myself. But I'm saying words, have, those, what I'm saying is words have power. And not just what we say, but also how we say them. Uh, Pastor Chad has shared an example in here before um, about how your tone is a, just as important as the words that you speak. Yeah, and if there's one thing I get in trouble for by my wife or even staff remind me sometimes, it's not about what I'm saying, but it's my tone. Because if I get stressed and I get overwhelmed, it's not how, what I say, but it's how I say it. 
Anybody else, you know, feel like you do the same thing? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's, it's about how we say whatever it is because our words have power and we don't realize. I wonder now, as I've been going through this uh, with Brittany, we've been preparing for this. I wonder what words I might have spoken to someone in the past that they're recalling and it was hurtful to them. I don't want to just blame someone else and say it was, they were all bad, but I wonder what words I've spoken that may have been detrimental to someone. I didn't mean at the time, or maybe it was joking, but words do have power. Um, so let me, let us, we're going to transition to the, to the passage of Scripture this morning. Um, this, this comes from the book of James. Um, J James is my favorite book of the Bible, um, and um, it, I believe that it is the most applicable book of the Bible. Uh, it's the book that if someone says to me, hey, Chad, I need to start reading my Bible, I usually say, go to the book of James, because there's so much application. It's close to the back of the Bible, uh, but it is written by James, the brother of Jesus. And the reason I, I really want to share this book with you today is that um, James, being the brother of Jesus, did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. So it makes me wonder, James is going to talk about our, the importance of our words. It makes me wonder, why did James write these words? Could he have, in fact, said to Jesus some things that he wished he wouldn't have said. You know, think about it. If you grew up with a guy and he all of a sudden says he's the Messiah, you might be saying, you know, yeah, right. You know, you were born a mom and dad. Now, you know, not, you're not someone special. But James writes these words. We don't know exactly why, but it, I believe someday I want to get to, up to heaven and ask James, why did you write that? Because I'm sure he'd say, you know what, I probably said some things to mom and dad. And I probably said some things to Jesus that I shouldn't have said. So I wonder now if that's why he actually said those things and wrote these things. So we're going to just go verse by verse or take a couple of verses. And then Brittany and I are sort of un unpack them together. So James starts in James chapter 3 verse 1 and says this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Anybody want to become a teacher after reading that? <laughs> um, Pastor Chad, you're a teacher by profession. Um, Sally, Marshall, I'm sure there are others in the room who are teachers by profession. Um, but I think we're all teachers whether or not we understand that, whether or not we realize it. We're all teaching somebody something. We're all leading people in some way. Um, parents, you're leading your children. You're teaching your children. Older siblings, you're teaching your younger siblings. Um, so we're, we're all teaching somebody something. Whether or not that's our chosen profession, we are all teachers. So what he's saying here is what you say, other people are watching. They're listening, and you're responsible for how your words are spoken and how they affect and how they lead other people. And he goes on to say, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. The tongue is one of the most difficult parts of the body, basically, to keep under control. You know, how do I know that? from my experience. Have you ever said something you wish you could take back? You think about life, you know, you say it and you go, oh, boy, I'd like to have that back. You know, it's so hard. We, so many times we don't think before we speak and then we regret it. And I, I've heard this said several years ago that, you know, the tongue is so hard to control that God actually put two gates that sometimes we don't use to keep it held back. He gave you teeth. So it's hard to talk. And then he also gave you lips. That's how hard it is to control or keep it in check, as Brittany said. But he says, if I can control my tongue, I can control my whole body. So basically, what we say affects everything we do. 
like we said in the introduction, everything you say affects everything that you do in life. He goes on in verse 3 through 6 and says, basically these are examples. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the ship's pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it is itself on, set on fire by hell. So um, in each of these examples, there are a few examples there. In each example, the whole, this larger item, this larger object is controlled by something very small. And I want to go back to verse 4 because there's something that stands out to me in verse 4. Um, Joe, could you get that on the screens? Um, it says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. This time when I was reading this scripture, it's funny how when you can read the same verse over and over, and sometimes God reveals something different to you. And this time what stood out to me is the phrase that says, they are driven by strong winds. So you already have a large vessel. The wind is driving it somewhere, but this teeny tiny part compared to the whole, this small part, has the power to steer it despite the wind or steer it against the wind. And he's comparing that to our tongue, to the way we speak to other people. Um, and so even in the midst of a big storm, sometimes life gives us storms, and even in the midst of a big storm, the way we speak has the power to determine where we're going to go. Yeah, and where we're going to go with our words. You know, I think about our life sometimes, and I used this example a moment ago, but sometimes life gets stressful. I don't know if anybody's ever realized that or not. Maybe I'm the only one that realizes that sometimes life gets stressful. Sometimes life get, gets hard. And so basically what it's saying is when life gets difficult, a lot of times, it, it, you know, the effects of that storm or whatever's going on are demonstrated through our words what we say and how we say it. If I go home after a stressful day, you know, here or whatever in, the, in you know, in, in, in the workplace, and all of a sudden I, um, Linda asked me a question and I say to Linda something, you know, she's like, well, how's your day? Fine. Well, you know, the reality of that is my response was not based on her question. My response was based on the storm. And so it, you know, it direct, it directs usually the whole evening. You know, my response or her response to whatever will direct our whole evening. We're going to keep uh, reading and we're going to pick up in verse 7. It says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. One of my greatest illustrations uh, that I've used, Becky Mallet did it first five or six, seven years ago uh, in a children's story, was um, toothpaste. You ever try to get toothpaste back into the toothpaste uh, container? It doesn't work. The same way with our words. Do you know how many times I've said something and wish I could have taken it back? As soon as it goes out, you're like, oh, you wish you could, you know, you wish you had a, you know, a rod and reel for fishing and bring it, reel it back in. You know, has anybody else been that way? You know, if you, there are things that you say that um, you wish you could take back. Um, and sometimes they're less kind. Uh, they don't really show love. Um, you know, if I often think about a waitress and her waiter at the restaurant, 
if they don't take good care of you and they, you know, they, they come back and uh, they say, well, how was your service? You know, you want to say it was horrible. Good luck getting a tip. I mean, that's what you want to say. But, you know, maybe that person's had a hard day. We don't know what they've gone through. Um, no matter what the circumstances are, um, I think the spirit of what James is saying is that um, you are still responsible for the words that you speak and your relationship with somebody, the circumstances. Um, there's no excuse that allows us to be irresponsible with our words to others. Yeah, and, but, you know, the reality is that sometimes I think we are less guarded with our words around the people that are closest to us. You know, we tend to hurt sometimes people that are close to us, and it shouldn't be. You know, your husband, your wife, your children, you know, people, because a lot of times we know, well, they're not going to leave us or that, you know, they're going to forgive us. But I think we need to be as guarded, if not more guarded around those that we love with our words versus just, um, you know, people from the outside. Um, I'll, I'll never forget in college, you've heard me say this. There was a young girl who said um, to me, I, my, I'd gone through a horrible time. I lost my mom. Um, and I didn't realize how bitter I was. And I must have been speaking words that I didn't realize. And this girl who I was in college with said to me one day, Chad, you're not as nice as you think you are. And I'm going to tell you what, that was an eye-opening experience for me because I thought the words that I was saying were nice. But that's not what was coming out of my mouth, and that's not what other people were hearing. Um, so, you know, that was an eye-opening experience for me. He goes on to say in verses 9 through 12, With the tongue we praise our God, or, or praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who were made in the likeness of God. So if we insult other people, or if we say something that's not kind to other people, we're insulting God because these people, everyone on this planet, was made in the image of God. So we have to be careful because what we say about somebody else, we're saying about God. That's pretty hard. Those are pretty harsh words that James is sharing. And again, I believe James has le learned those from his own experience. Um, he goes on to say, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig, fig tree bear olives? Or a grape vine bear figs, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So he's basically saying that what you're made of is what comes out. A salt water is going, or a salt um, salt spring is going to produce salt water because that's what it's made of. That's what it's comprised of. Fresh water comes from a fresh water source, and so what's inside is going to be what comes out. I think you've probably heard the phrase, somebody regrets something they said, and, and then you're like, well, if you weren't thinking it, you wouldn't have said it. So this is kind of similar. There's another verse um, that we found when we were preparing. Um, it's not on the screens, but it's in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. And part of that verse says, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So if we're, if we're wanting to love other people, if we want to show others God's love, we have to have that in our hearts first. We have to harbor love for God, and we have to want to demonstrate that to other people. Um, if, if we don't speak kindly to other people, they're going to feel like we don't love them, whether or not we do. So our words demonstrate God's love. Well, and I also think, just what you said, not only... Do we not love them? But sometimes I think people question, do we love God at all? Do you, you know, based on what you're saying, do you really love God? And that's really, I think, what James is saying. I'll never forget several years ago, someone spoke this to me. Let me give you an example. This was not a positive example towards someone at all. But this person was sharing to me 
how they would watch their, their spouse get up on a Sunday morning and sing in the choir and praise God and raise their hands and they sang in the choir and they would speak all of these words. And the person says, then they get in the car and they start cussing me out, complaining about everything I've ever done wrong. And, and the person was like, how is that to be? You know, they were just in, the, in church raising their hands, praising God, and then get in the car and immediately attack me as their spouse. And it was just a pretty amazing example. Our words have to match our character. That's, I think, the essence of these verses 9 through 12. Our words have to match our character. And in verse 9, he said um, that human beings have been made in God's likeness. He's telling us what our character should be. It should be similar to that of God. And so I, I think this is why sometimes when we choose not to act godly, when we choose not to demonstrate God's love, I think this is sometimes why people view Christians as hypocritical, because our character or the character that they expect might not match the words that we're speaking out loud. Absolutely. And so it's just for me a test to be reminded about, you know, the words that I say will either reflect God's love or detract people, you know, away from God. Um, and so, you know, last week we mentioned that the essence of God is love. That came from our scripture last week. So when we're not loving, and one of the ways we show love to people is, as Brittany said, everything's about our words. If, if our words don't match that character, if those words don't match the essence of who God's God is, we're not good representatives of God. You know, if our words don't match that, that's what James is saying is your words are important and we need to consider how our words affect other people. Because I'm going to tell you what, I've learned that words affect me. I'm thinking that all of you probably could say the same thing. So if they affect me, then I need to really think about how my words affect other people. And so one of the ways we've talked about in this uh, book that we show love to people and that people feel loved are by words. It doesn't say words of criticism, but words of affirmation. Um, and so our words matter most to those we're trying to love. I love this verse in Proverbs. This, again, is not on the screen. This was a verse that I thought about. Um, with our words. Proverbs 12, 18. There is one whose words pierce like a sword. Like my eighth grade uh, mechanical drawing teacher, his words cut me like a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. I don't know about you, but I pray that my words bring more healing to people than they do scars. Let me say that one more time. I pray that our words bring more healing than they do scars. Because I'm sure there are people out there who my words have caused scars. As I know people in, you know, who have spoken words to me that are less scars. But I hope as I grow in my faith I hope as I grow my relationship with the Lord that those words are less likely to be hurtful because I want to demonstrate God's love to other people. Will you pray with me? Words matter to people, and they also matter to you. Brittany shared in verse 1, where we're accountable for our words. Lord, with our mouth, we praise you in this worship center on a Sunday morning. We pray, we honor you, but I pray that we are learning 
that our words have power, the power to build somebody up or to tear somebody down. And if we are trying to love people, our words should never leave scars. Lord, I pray today for each person here that as we go into this week that we will think about our words and may we learn to control the tongue just as James shared with us. We're going to fail. We're not always going to say the right thing. But Lord, I hope more often than not that we're saying words in the most loving possible way because that will demonstrate your love for, the, for other people and our love for them as well. Father, I pray as we get ready to go into this invitation time. First, I want to pray for those people who may have had words spoken to them that have left scars. And may they pray today and ask, God, ask you, God, to... Uh, Help them to overcome those words and not see themselves the way someone else spoke. But then also, Lord God, maybe there's somebody we've spoken harshly to even this week. Maybe you convict us of that. Maybe you um, reveal that. It's something on our heart and maybe we need to go to that person and say, I'm sorry for my words. Lord, help us to have words of life that speak life to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.